Good afternoon, everyone, and I'll declare the meeting open. And Nadia, can I ask you in terms of opening Karakia, please? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, with all things going and the bold move that the government has made, I'm thank you for allowing us to stick to our kawa and our tikan. お<音楽><音楽> Te Next item's the health and okay. Um, we'll take that statement, which is on page four as a, as read. There's no resolution required. Apologies. Now we have some which are on the so we've got apologies from David Spears and at this stage from Rangika Wilson for lateness, Councillor Carolyn and Councillor Bruce. Are there any other apologies? <laughs> okay. Um, if I can have a mover and seconder for those, please. Looking at Angela, seconded by Sarah. I'll put that. All those in favour against carried. Um, just before we'll go to, before the next item, confirmation of agenda, um, I'll just go to Richard Ward, who's with us, and um, if you can just um, introduce um, Vanessa Richard. Yes, if you can. Um, oh, kia ora tato. and for those of you who aren't familiar, but um, I have Vanessa Blakelock with me today, and Vanessa is our partnership director um, based up in the Auckland Policy Office. And so over the last little bit, we've been transitioning my, I guess, relationships and future proof sort of role um, from myself through to Vanessa. So this is her first future proof meeting, and probably on that basis, probably my last one. But yeah, and we've been spent the last couple of days around and meeting with different councils and introducing Vanessa. Uh, thank you very much for the welcome. And um, it is an absolute pleasure to be here. And hello to those of you who I've met previously and look forward to um, working with everybody around the table and getting to know some of you. And um, as Richard says, I'm based just up the road in Auckland. So I'm, I'm keen for you to know that in terms of my accessibility and um, ease of, of coming here in person. So I look forward to working with you. No, um, certainly, and, and welcome, Vanessa, um, and certainly on behalf of the um, Future Proof Committee and all the um, staff and officials here, really look forward to, to working with you going forward. So, um, and you're not that far away, just been just up the road. So, no. Warm welcome. Thank you. So right, we'll get next item is the confirmation of the agenda. Um, and it's not proposed that the order of business be changed or any other items. So I'm happy to move that, seconded by Sarah. There's nothing further on that. I'll put that. All those in favour? Against? Are there any disclosures of interest in terms of matters on the agenda? 
And I will kick off on that um, in terms of the last item in the public excluded. Um, so given it's about um, the implementation, the independent chair role, um, I will leave the meeting and disappear over the hill. And um, Liz, um, as deputy chair, will chair that item. Any other um, disclosures of interest? Okay, there's nothing there. We will move to item six, the confirmation of minutes of our last meeting on 15 September. I can have a mover and seconder for that, please. And they, they start on page five. Okay, Mia Jackie, do I have a seconder for those? Okay, Chair Pamela, um, any matters requiring correction of those minutes? There are not, I'll put that. All those in favor say aye against carried and we'll move to the receipt of minutes which is item number seven commencing on page 19 and those are the minutes of the future proof public transport subcommittee and as part of that there is a recommendation to this committee which is picked up in the subsequent report in terms of robert's implementation advisor report so we can discuss that recommendation at that point in time. So if I can have someone to move receipt of those minutes. Thanks, Angela. Seconded by Mayor Susan. There's nothing further. I'll put those. All those in favour? Against carried. Now, item eight and the implementation of advisors report commencing on page 27. Robert. So next time around, this report will turn up as a traffic light report. Um, what I'll just talk through is highlight the areas that are orange or red in um, in terms of traffic light reporting if it was in place. So paragraphs three and four cover uh, an area that's working as per plan, which is the rollout of some of the new program management functions within the implementation office. Um, so that just details work that the team have underway and that we'll report to you in due course or you'll see in changes coming through and how we report. Then the report moves to um, reporting against our transformational goals, which is where we've, we're focusing or prioritising our efforts. So the first of our transformational goals, iwi aspirations, enhancing the health and wellbeing of the Waikato River in accordance with Taturi Whaimana, the vision and strategy, and iwi place-based aspirations. I'm reporting that as a as a green. That piece of that work is underway. We've got a, a scoping study underway that will pro scope up a, a review of our water strategy, which will demonstrate how we're giving effect to Turi Um There's an interesting piece of work which Nanaya and Waikato Tainui are working on to improve their GIS databases in terms of rights of first refusal property um, across the subregion and in. The, if that work gets done as planned, we'll have a much better idea of the implications of our settlement pattern for UE place-based aspirations. So um, looking forward to that piece of work progressing. Um, the one bit around the water work program that is orange still is the completion of a bunch of technical studies um, that we commissioned a couple of years ago, actually, <laughs> around um, case studies and different ways that we could manage water within the subregion. Um, those technical studies are in the final stage of completion. I'd hope to have them completed for this meeting. Um, they will come to your next meeting uh, as studies, and they look at things like what are the cost implications if we were to daylight streams in our urban areas? What are some of the things we can do in terms of achieving a water-wise community and water efficiency in urban areas? How might we use environmental offsetting regimes to restore and protect the Waikato River? That kind of stuff, which all feeds into the water scoping work um, that will also come to your March meeting in terms of scoping that water strategy. The red in our work program is our progress towards achieving that, that 
what is currently the radical transport shift to a multimodal transport network. Um, whilst the technical officers are doing a lot of good work um, in the background, we are constrained by funding as a consequence of the change in government and our inability to access the um, intended funding for progressing our transport program business cases. Um, so we're looking at plan B at the moment, the, the team are working with Waka Katahi about what we can do with the funding we have available to keep progress rolling along. Um, but I have colored that red. That was a particular item that was discussed at the Future Proof Public Transport Subcommittee. Their resolution to us is on paragraph 14, and they had a good discussion about, well, there's quite a lot of projects we had intended to deliver in the subregion that are not funded as a consequence of the um, changes in decision making with changes in government. Um, what do we do about that? And where that's where that resolution lands. We've discussed that as chief executives. Um, and our view is that the best process is actually just to accept that we've got new ministers in place and we need to start building a relationship with those ministers and getting them to understand our strategies and priorities as subregion. And so that the proposal is that will be a focus for us in the new year once they've had time to read all of their briefings to incoming ministers and get their head around their portfolio um, and how they interact with future proof. Um, and then the last one, the, the rest of the report, really our work program at the moment is focused on getting the future development strategy completed. Um, I'll note, in the last, in paragraph 22 of my report, the final thing to note is as part of developing the future development strategy, staff have identified that, that the link between our future development strategy and our region's economic development strategy and opportunities is not as strong as it could be. The storytelling is not as clear as it could be. We're working with Tawaka to, to see what we can do to make that better. And we're expecting a submission from Tawaka that would come into the FDS for us to um, improve that linkage, which is really important if we want to tell a story to the government about why they should invest in the region. That's it for me. Okay, thanks, Robert. Open for questions, comments. Angela, are you? <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you, Robert, for the summing up. Yeah, I know that we did have a quite a good discussion at the PT subcommittee about um, the SURF funding being withdrawn prior to a minister giving direction. Um, however, we will move forward. Um, <laughs> I was just wondering, with the previous government, we did have ministers who had attended and were quite heavily interested in the work that we're doing here, given the importance of our area to New Zealand Inc. I was just wondering where the thinking is at um, to engage with the new government around their attendance um, at Future Proof moving forward. Perhaps so I see we've got Anne Shaw online and we've also got Richard here. Um, whether either of you would like to make any comments around that first. <laughs> okay. I'm happy to if that's okay. helpful, Bill. <laughs> Looks like it's you, Anne. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Richard. Can you hear me all right? I've got my headphones yes. on, yep. so that's good. Okay. Look, um, as you might imagine, it's a pretty busy time for our new ministers. They're getting their heads around their portfolios. There is much focus on 100-day priorities, so we haven't had a chance to brief them on urban growth partnerships. Well, um, we certainly haven't at the HUD area yet, so uh, I think as we come into probably the new year, we'll be getting some more guidance and able to have some conversations with ministers about um, how they see urban growth partnerships and and what they think their participation will be in the future. But it is going to take a bit of time for them to settle down. Most of them don't have, uh, aren't fully staffed in their offices. They're still unpacking boxes. And as the House has started this week, it's a pretty busy 100-day work program at the moment. So um, they haven't had a chance to um, get briefed on 
many and varied topics certainly uh, at our end yet, but I know they'll be very interested in the work of Future Proof. Uh, I think what we discussed at the CE's meeting was putting an invitation out there for when when it suited them to come and um, to come and join the meeting. Uh, as their diaries allowed, might be just a, a good way and providing some background information on, on the partnership might be a good place to start. Thanks, Anne. And as a result of that, that's what we, we, we intend to do. Any other questions or comments in terms of Robert's report? Okay. Oh, there's oh, nothing. Yes. Oh, yep, sorry, Sarah. Yeah, no, I just <laughs> slipped right in there then. Um, just a question, Robert, around uh, like we've heard there's a 100 day plan and various things all being unpicked and put back together again in some cases. Um, are there areas where it would be most beneficial for us to put joint submissions or at least aligned submissions with, because we've talked about the need for some joined up messaging? Great question. Um, I mean, we have all we've seen so far are the bullet points in the hundred day plan in terms of what they're working on. So, so that's not a lot for us to work on in terms of submitting on things. Yeah. The stuff I'm tracking is, is the conversations about city region deals, which mm. are not in the hundred day plan, mm. but are really, really important to us in terms of implementation of the strategy. So, we'll come to a discussion on that and our approach to that later in the. There's one, isn't there? It had to be me later in the day. <laughs> um, we're also tracking the the statements around the future for the NPS freshwater. Uh, and in some of the government policies, the NPS urban development, um, NPS um, high productivity land kind of figures. So we need to get our head around what that means. Yeah. Um, but at the moment, it, I, we haven't got enough detail to really work mm. through what we would do. It's trendy. But I guess when it when more detail arises, there might be a conversation around whether there's value in yeah, absolutely definitely. Yeah. And and particularly in that city and region deal space. Mm -hmm. Um it's really important that we as a sub region present collectively in that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And I think just following on from that um part of that is having some of those discussions both around the chief executive's advisory group table and also the senior management groups um, mm. in terms of those matters and those opportunities for that, for that joining up and that consistent message on whatever the particular topic is. Okay, thank you. And I suppose this might be something we can take offline, but when we do get ministers hopefully joining these meetings, um, I'd be interested in how we look at the agenda in terms of uh, what my impression was over the last few meetings that I I watched when we had ministers coming in that they kind of stay for a short amount of time at the start often and then do have pressing matters and need to go. So how we make the best use of that first half hour or so of mm -hmm. um so there's a comp yeah, a clear messaging coming through and yeah, they're un I, I, and just following on, I think that's why it will be important in terms of engaging and discussing with with Anne and Vanessa, David and Co. In terms of of that, yeah. what that approach looks like. Mm. Okay, thank you. Me and Jackie. Mm, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, two questions, two areas. Simple one first. Um, Com strategy for FPIC and in terms of, you know, there's lo lots of work programs, perhaps I should have started from my other question. Uh, I'm seeing it like there's lots of work programs and so I was kind of see them in isolation as opposed to how they all interconnect, uh, how they interconnect and help each other enhance the, the whole, the whole. And therefore, how do we then, and what is the plan going forward around that comms? And our strategy around those that, that making sure that we all understand that complexities of the interrelatedness of all the work programs is silos. Yeah. And then how we then communicate that and understand it internally as well as externally. So that is the the job of the comm strategy is to come up with a coherent communications 
story as we have products to tell and how they link together. So the in terms of the comms strategy, I can bring a report back on what our comms program is, is probably the easiest way. Our first steps, to be honest, are refreshing a really poor website um, and making that, being able to, putting that into a place where we can start pushing information out about what our work program is and what we're doing, but also some members only pages that we can share a lot more information through, which we haven't got at the moment. Um, and also allowing us to take submissions in and things like that. So that's the first step is just getting some of those fundamental basics in. Um, the next piece that we're focusing on is communicating the um, less about the detail of the work programs, but more about if we implement all of the work programs, what the region will look like in 30 years. And so that's a piece where we've got some draft material being done at the moment, substantially completed, and we're moving to the next level. Which is kind of talking about in 30 years, what will how will we live and move around the city? What will wastewater solutions look like? What will our density look like? That kind of stuff. So it's coming. So um, TikTok is in because it's, mm. <laughs> uh, like, it's a lot, and all those work, things coming to this and seeing that picture for the future, mm. those aspirations, um, and that synergy. And I guess this is part of the FTS, but. I still win. Like, you know, we've talked about the website being updated and things like that. Yeah. Um, and so those I, things, I guess. When? <laughs> so or some time to, be, to be honest, I actually just let the contract, I hope, yep. was that if we signed the piece of paper, we've just let the contract in the last week for the website redesign. So the when is before your next meeting, you will see a refreshed website. You'll also receive the comms messaging for that. What will it look like in the future, at least in a draft form for the next meeting? Okay, thank you. So, any other questions or comments? Anything on? Sorry. No, it's nothing. Okay, thanks, Mayor Adrian. Were you seconding Liz? <laughs> okay, if there's nothing further, I'll put that. All those in favour? Aye. Against, carried. So we'll move to um, item nine, which is the adoption of the future development strategy. Um, just before I um, hand to Robert to take us through that, and in particular some suggested additions, um, it is very important um, that we approve this for consultation today in terms of getting it out there, getting submissions in, because it also is an input into the um, the long-term plans, et cetera. So um, I, I'm just putting that on the table um, and also realising that there have been challenges in terms of some of the technical information. Um, however, we still have opportunities also in terms of submissions to the strategy um, in, in terms of if there are also matters that where there are gaps or there needs to be further fine tuning or additions or changes. So um, we still have that process available to us. Robert. And all is that document. <laughs> <laughs> so in addition to what's laid out in the paper, um, our technical staff and a number of um, individual members have contacted me with questions or suggestions for amendments or things that they've spotted in the strategy. For a slide which Lyndall is about to share that sets out some um, changes from that we're proposing from what you have in front of you. So I'll just talk through those really quickly. Microphone on. So I'll just talk through those very quickly. The first off, um, you'll see that we've proposed a bunch of amendments through the strategy to try to bring um, it, the Madame Adapiaco story and the Hauraki story more clearly in. Um, we realised when we were reviewing that again that the transformational moves still don't really speak to Madame Ada and Hauraki. So there's some words to be added to the explanation. You know, the one that talks about the the river talks about the Waikato River. It doesn't talk about the Hauraki. 
um, rivers. Uh, and likewise, there's no connection or recognition that actually from Matamata, it's halfway between two metro centres, so sometimes Tauranga forms its metro centre, and that kind of speaks to our State Highway 29 conversation. So a little bit of tweaking to happen, less in the move, or not in the moves themselves, but in the paragraphs that sit under the moves outlining what they mean for us, I think. That's one change. Um, and look, this is an iterative thing, Rolling Matamata into the partnership is going to take us some time to get the strategy right, um, and there's a lot more technical work to be done. Um, the second issue that's come up is that the we've got those areas of, of land um, within the Southern Links designation, between Southern Links designation and Hamilton that we call SL1 and SL2. Um, we haven't done the work to work out which bits of those areas of land are actually suitable for urbanization and what type of urban land use you would put into those areas of, of land. But we do need to recognize that there is a boundary adjustment agreement um, in the strategy between Waipa and Hamilton. Um, so there's some wording that we will need to add in just to recognize that that agreement exists and it's deterred, dependent in part on us determining what is the future urban form and getting ready for development of those um, those pieces of land. So we'll, we're proposing to add a note that makes that explicit. Um, there's uh, a conversation that you actually, the members actually raised with the team and myself and, and I committed to, to make sure it flowed into the document around the role of water reticulation in becoming an urban area. So we want to clarify by way probably of a new directive in the um, Blue Green Networks chapter that urban areas are expected to be publicly reticulated for three waters. So it's expected to, it doesn't mean you have to do it in all situations, but it's a starting offer that the first offer should be if you're creating an urban environment, you should reticulate it. Um, I, there is a, a a conversation that you may want to have about whether that applies across everywhere or if it's just related to the metro area. So I'll, I'll, that's a conversation for, you, for us to have today. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to, to really emphasize the role of the annual implementation plan we're, we're required to prepare under the NPS urban development. So as we've started to engage with some of the development community um, about the draft FDS, um, they've raised a bunch of issues for us, which we're just not ready to deal with. Um, but the annual implementation plan is the space that we can deal with those issues. Um, so I've, I've recommended a note um, that says that we actually make explicit that this annual implementation plan exists so that we have a place that we can send those recommendations. We don't want to change the strategy for yet, but we want to go away and do further work. And fortunately, we've got four things that we've thought of ourselves already that we need to, to signal should be dealt with by that annual implementation plan. The first one being any recommended amendments to regional policy statements, district and regional plans and long-term plans to respond to the FDS. The next thing is, and this relates to our three-year work program, um, to determine the appropriate range of land uses and infrastructure requirements, and that's South Hamilton, North Waipa area. So that covers the SL1, SL2 area, but also around the airport. Um, where we're under a lot of pressure from uh, development entities like RAL, the airport company, to free up more land for urban development. Uh, but also North Waikato, South Auckland, so how the northern part of our region links into the new city in Drury South and what that looks like in terms of a community and what we might need to think about as future proof. And finally, that Hamilton to Tauranga corridor work to mirror what we've done with the Hamilton to Auckland corridor work. So those are three pieces of work that are already in our work program that we would flag here in the strategy. Uh, refinement to our monitoring and reporting framework, as you'll see in the strategy that where we have been able to do agree KPIs and measures, we've inserted them like for affordable housing, but there's a bunch of other outcome areas that we have yet to deal with. Uh, and finally, um, look, just acknowledging a, an area of pressure in the strategy, which we're really struggling to deal with, is the, the rural retirement townships and the pressure to create them in a bunch of different places um, that have no public transport services, often have no water services in the middle of nowhere. 
So there's an action to engage with the retirement sector to better understand dem demand and review what we need to do as a strategy, but also to try to influence their thinking about where might be a good place to put a retirement village. Um, because at the moment we have no dialogue with that sector whatsoever until they turn up with a planning application, which is way too late in the system. Um, so those are the amendments that the staff are proposing that we add. Anything else? Is that it? No, okay. that's it. Okay, I'll open Thank it up for Miffy. Did you want to add anything? I have to push the right button. There would help. Uh, kia ora tato. Um, so there were, I just had a couple of comments just quickly. Um, so this, um, as you know, the Future Proof strategy was substantially updated uh, and adopted last year. So we do see this as a, a more a refining and a ref, um, finessing of the strategy and just making sure we're ticking all the boxes in terms of the NPS for urban development and bringing in Manamata Piako. Um, a couple of things to note. Um, so that just that that we don't have that final business HBA. So it is important um, to recognise that residential, uh, the residential story has been updated, but not the industrial. And that's where that implementation plan becomes really important, as Robert has noted. Um, following on from the affordable housing discussion that we had at the workshop in October, um, affordable housing targets for each district other than NPDC have been included in the strategy and the KPIs. So. Um, Axel did some really great work talking to all the TAs, um, getting agreement to the, um, the the targets that have been used, which are based on the residential um, housing and business um, development capacity assessment um, that we have there. Um, and yeah, so this is the final opportunity prior to adoption for feedback. We can make minor changes up to the date of um, notification. Um, and, the, and more significant matters that do arise between now and then can be addressed through a submission. Um, so we are asking you to adopt the strategy for consultation, um, authorising the ind independent chair to make those minor um, changes that if we spot any errors, if anything comes up that is that we need fixing, we can do that. Um, agreeing to that five week consultation period and delegating to the independent chair the authority to sort out all the details around the dates and bits and pieces that we need to do to make the hearings happen. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Got Mayor Adrian. Um, just a couple of things. It's good that um, obviously picked up to pick our, our mana whenua in our area and just some of the detail because um, Rokawa fits into MPDC as well. So there's, yeah, that's, long, that's, that's done, that's great. Um, just, I had a question just around the, um, on page 34, just the thriving resilient communities and neighbourhoods, and I'm just not sure about the wording. Just because it it's been amended and it just sort of looks like it's been added in and doesn't really look like I'm not I'm not a great wordsmith but I don't know that this sort of it sort of doubles up a little bit perhaps or it's not succinct but yeah I just sort of wonder if it's saying the same thing twice in some respects just around other than wordsmith can I can we look at the drafting and yeah get the chair to, to be my grammar now yeah that'd be good because I don't yeah I don't I just sort of feel it's sort of it, it doesn't run smoothly as a as a statement. Mm. If if I could be just give, them. it's got a lot of stuff flung into it. Yeah, yeah, and it's sort of. I'm sure we can be more succinct or more clear in that. In that. But that's that's the only feedback I had, other than thanks for including our manafino and our rivers. Okay. Other questions or comments in terms of the draft. Liz. Yeah, look, just to say that we're comfortable with those changes, especially the retirement one. Everyone wants to grow old in Cambridge now. Me and Jackie. District of Champions. I agree. I'm, I'm, I'll, put my, I'll put my name down too. <laughs> you got a payment plan? Um, yeah, just uh, I agree with it's a good. I, we agree with the changes. That one that just a little bit concerning. It's only probably just a word or two on page forty six, and also I think it comes up on in the middle of it. It's uh, part B, chapter nine, rural areas number three. Everyone's looking at that page forty six, and I think it also comes under yeah, it's nine point three rural growth. So on it just it says uh, it's basically adding text to. 
about limiting rural residential development, which is quite an umbrella statement across all rural and provincial district councils. Uh, how we limit it is and it's the highly productive soils and in accordance with the future proof or our Waikato 2070 growth plans. Uh, so because obviously we don't want and we've already planned not to have fragmentation across all rural areas, but to limit residential development is a big umbrella statement if that's the interpretation of it. So just really wanted clarity around ensuring that we're talking about the right focus. Hopefully Mickey's looking for the actual strategy. So on the agenda, it's page 46. Yeah, I'm just I'm looking yeah, for the, the precise strategy. words in the strategy yeah. and what they say. Yeah. Just why that's been looked at, we'll come back. Any other questions or comments at this point? Mayor Paula. We're going to come back to that matter once they've okay. found the, um, the draft strategy and the actual wording. We're largely happy with it. Um, maybe I haven't seen it, but the overarch the overarching um, concept we were talking about at lunchtime mm -hmm. about being some extent, extent a boundaryless sub regional area as opposed to three holding hands or holding hands separate unitaries. We need to kind of still weave a little bit more of that understanding. This is what future proof exists for is to to create a sub regional growth success story. I didn't I didn't see quite so much preamble in this. Or are we just gonna assume that's all is there a reference to boundary list? I think there is in the opening probably. I can check that I we've got a reference to boundary list planning, particularly in that opening session section that we're having actually from the whole committee rather than from, so. from Bill as chair. You know, what time are you the introduction thing. Yeah. Because it is a key principle of what we do. Yeah, that that's right. Because yeah. um based on what we were discussing at lunch, we all want part, every part of the region, sub region that we're talking about to thrive and have their opportunities to thrive, but we're operating mm -hmm. as a sub-regional unit for the purposes of better gain and better outcomes. I just don't think we should forget that, otherwise... We can certainly check on that, because it was actually a matter that came up with the smart growth hearings earlier this, this week, Paula, in terms of that commitment. Yeah. Okay, have we found this... Yeah, so I guess it's on page, yeah, thank you, page 84. So you're taking okay, so we're looking five. currently at the rural areas. Yeah, 9.6. If we take that literally, as Sarah said, 9.6, are we like, we'll wipe off Tamahiri and any other developments like Tamahiri around, that it was Love Axel. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess we're just wanting to focus on we've got we've done our work around the district plan, obviously, you know, 2070 growth around rural growth. We know where we want it, we don't know where we don't have it. We've got the NPS, just making sure that when we're talking about limited, what is it actually referring to? That's my to be honest, the intent of this this directive. Not on. Right. We've got too many speakers on. Paula, can you? Oh, sorry. Yeah. So I think the intent of this directive was to to say that we should avoid more Tamaheris right on the boundary of Hamilton. I think it's pretty explicit in terms of the intent of this directive, and I think it's. Uh, it's kind of a it's a big fundamental question. Yeah. So so from an urban planning perspective, um, I would suggest that rural residential 
right up against the boundaries of Hamilton isn't a great planning outcome. Um, but I'll let the Hamilton team speak to that a bit more. <laughs> <laughs> Whether you want to, Blair, or others, yeah. Yeah. I guess there's not very much clarity around what is the vicinity of Hamilton. Um, and, and, you know, people want to live metro. And look, we're on those pages of good town planning. That's your fundamental and supporting that growth in Hamilton. However, having variations of, light, of, of housing options for people is not for me to say that what, they, what the demand of the market is. And we're very clear about how we manage that, understanding our partners and the the need, one for the need for good town planning and two, supporting the FPIC in the bigger picture. So really just some of those statements are just wanted more clarity of that. It says provide a clear definition. So what does that mean in terms of around the facility? As an example, you know, MPS soils, we've got a map that's very specific. But when the statement's saying all urban growth, all rural growth, that's quite a big statement. Thanks, thanks, Mayor Jackie. Um, so, look, I think the vicinity of Hamilton uh, reflects the fact that it's a high high growth area, and there's a lot of demand for residential development, whether it be large lot or otherwise. Um, and without strict controls, you will get a proliferation of quasi urban development occurring in the rural zone around Hamilton. Um, and and for, to Rob's point, that's not an economic, uh, not a good economic outcome either a for the primary um, agricultural sector or from a land use planning point of view in terms of the services that those residential um, areas will then be reliant largely on Hamilton for services. So if if we are going to pursue uh, an expansionary urban development policy, then then that should be done in an integrated manner, um, should be serviced um, and it should be planned and coordinated, not on an ad hoc basis. Bill Latendi here, can I just oh, jump in? Hang on, I've, I've got a number of people um, lined up to speak. So, Mayor Jackie. I'm just going to let this... Oh. You just want to let it... Okay, I'll just stay on this topic for the moment. So in turn, and then I've got there's me, Susan, Angela, then Andy. Were, were you? You're fine. Yeah. Okay. Andy can go before. Okay. Because mine's different. Yeah. Andy, did you wanting to comment on this particular matter? Oh yeah, and and, and appreciating that you know this is this is a wicked I think. So um, I mean we've just adopted our um FDS and and. We have a similar issue, you know, with the rural and those those settlements outside, and then the pressures, I guess, of where do we allow that? Um, and so, as part of our FDS, we we're including, we're doing it as a, a bit of a rural um, in the south. We are including a rural strategy, and so we're actually going to be undertaking a rural strategy. So we actually get a grip on how we deal with the pressures, I guess, of that that rural demand. In the south, so that's you know bordering Waikato. So um, it was a, and we poked in the word appropriate. So um, in there, so yeah, it was just a just an approach we took because we have the same issues, and it's just a mechanism for us to try and deal with it by creating a specialist um, rural strategy within the FDS. Right, right. Thanks for that, Andy. Hey, I've got Angela. Yes, um, mine was slightly different. If we've got it's to close fine. Up that we'll, one, we may well circle back. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, you're just on page twenty-two of the actual draft strategy. Um, yeah, talking about our interregional rail. Um, yeah, just the wording that we've used um, doesn't quite describe 
we're trying to do there. Um, calling it a daily commuter rail service between Hamilton and Auckland. Um, if we could use the same messaging that we're trying to do about interregional rail connecting Waikato in Auckland. Thank you. Okay. Back to the vicinity. I was just <laughs> Mia Susan, did you have no, no, I was all good. No, no. Okay. You turn off your mic. Oh, <laughs> <Okay. laughs> <laughs> okay, we will now circle back. Robert. So so just um reflecting on on the that particular directive, the the main one, I think there's some work we could do in terms of defining the vicinity, what we mean by the vicinity of Hamilton. My nervousness is that there have been past experiences in, in my time on Future Proof, when I was in David's role, actually, where Hamilton um, Hamilton a map. had a map mm. and there was an amazingly visceral and uncomfortable reaction to Hamilton mapping its area of influence at the time. So so it's a, there's a little bit of where angels fear to tread from me here. <laughs> But we can we can put into the implementation plan an action to define the what we mean by vicinity. And also, I guess what what sort of because uh, if you take Tamahiri as a lifestyle area, what I call mm. lifestyle blocks, as opposed to intense urbanisation, as an example. So, yeah, just that, and also making sure that we're just talking about specific areas, perhaps around that Hamilton area rather than the whole. Yeah. So there's some different layers i think the intent was that it applied really to the to the rural residential development that is occurring in areas where logic would say at some point in the future it would be a better outcome to urbanize those areas fully which basically is the immediately on the boundaries of hamilton not well not just on further the, no when we look at the future proof the, yeah. the whole area within yeah. the, so the golden triangle of new zealand's economic development and growth that's just one of the growth areas yeah yeah and the gem of our Waikato, but yeah, yeah. we we have um, substantial growth in other parts. So True. just making sure that we cover off and that we're not misinterpreting or limiting while we also support. You got me? Yeah. Oh, I not so if it's around Hamilton, that's understand, understand, but it's a different, yeah. yeah so 9.6 is just around Hamilton. 9.5, which is the other one, is that clear definition between urban and rural areas, including through directing urban development to defined urban enablement areas and village enablement areas. I'm, I don't have the definitions of what is urban and village in front of me, whether Miffy or one of the team do. do we define those terms. Can I ask a question on this one? Yeah, I'll come. Mm. If it's about NPS, about the land, we're really clear about that. So that's, yeah. that's nice and simple. Yeah, yeah. Just, just really want to just get some understanding clarity. Thank you. Mia Paula. Yeah, I'm grappling with this one because I hear what you're saying, Jackie. Um, I'm also concerned, uh, like when you start putting maps, you're right, people kind of feel nervous about it, but surely this is around the impact on each other in various ways. And when we think about the vicinity of Hamilton, that's a, just a geographic concept. It's got nothing to do with the potential impact on us as a future proof area or on the city. So for example, uh, rural development is, is appropriate in some instances and in some it won't. And the last thing I think we need to see, if I'm gonna be bold and a bit naughty here, the last thing we need to see going forward is uh, numerous bespoke water treatment plants or water waste water plant solutions, um, notwithstanding we don't know what Three Brothers is gonna do, that then undermine the economic case for shared water facilities and services, but also that fuzzy area but that you can have a line on a map, as we do, um, Jackie, between um, your area and ours past mm -hmm. Roach Turner School, but, but your um, people come and use the peak and they come and use the library as they should. So there's a whole lot of work I know we're doing about how we can share services better across boundary. But at the moment, there is, there is the potential, unless we start talking about impact, for development in rural zones to have an unforeseen impact on the cost of Hamilton doing its business or maintaining or renewing its assets, 
or the cost of us future funding something. Um, I'm nervous, for example, and I just give an example, um, Southern Waste Water Plant that we've all agreed to buy into, that's, that's based, there's a business cost analysis and benefit analysis for all of us. If we then get allow, and even if we do, our Hamilton City allow developers to come in out of pace and, you know, different sequence, sorry, and they say that's fine because we'll do a pl plan change and we'll put a, our own water treatment or our own bespoke solution, then wouldn't it have a, a negative consequence on the business case of the better solution for us all? So I just don't see in the direct the directives, but I don't see a comment on managing the impact. And I'm not just thinking of impact just one way on the council, on the sit on the metro, but the impact on each other. I don't know if I made that clear. Did I make it clear? Mm -hmm. Sure. So um, just a suggestion with regards to the word vicinity, and I wonder whether we have some wording that um, something along the lines of ensuring that there is no rural residential development um, which will inhibit the growth of Hamilton City in the future um, and development that's done in accordance with the settlement pattern in the FDS and and the relevant district growth strategies. So we've got all of those already agreed to. So we're not going to be adding new rural residential areas that goes against against that. So I guess the concern is that, you know, there'll well, be that, new. That would be an improvement, I think, through you. That would be an improvement yeah. to acknowledge and be explicit about those things. I still feel there's potential, and I can't wordsmith it, and it's for the technical officers to have a go at, but I would like to say, shall we have a conversation about that, how we capture that impact? Because I'm not, I'm not trying to be selfish here and say all growth will come to Hamilton. I'm just saying we have a vested interest in getting this right together. Um, and we know you can accidentally undermine a business co uh, cost benefit analysis by doing something or no longer that doesn't stack up now. But we don't want to do that because we haven't got that. To be quite bullshit about it right now, we have not got the money we need for future infrastructure. So we better be really clear where we're going to do it and where we're going to do it, when we're going to do it, and who's contributing to that, and what helps that and what undermines that. I just, you know, maybe I'm just feeling that the um, intensity of the financial pressures we're facing and the churn of government, but I really feel quite strongly about that. Okay. Any other comments? Because I'm, um, it might actually allow a wee bit of time for the staff to get picking up um, Bashar's recommendation to get something that we could consider um, as some alternative wording. <laughs> yeah. Is there anything else on that matter before we move to any other yes. matters? Yes, I agree with what they, I think it needs just some consideration. That's what we're doing in the clarification. And secondly, um, yes, supporting things like the Southern Wastewater Treatment Plant, but we also have you know, our own wastewater treatment plants and our own business cases as well within that, that framework and agreements as well. So, yeah, it's not about trying to compete for residents or undermining, but we do need to clarify what those intents are, absolutely. Because if we don't do it here before it goes out, then I think it's going to be a lot more complicated and conflicting when we get submissions in. That's all. Okay. So, no. Yeah, I think it's good that we just have that time that the experts can <laughs> unpack that a little bit for us. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah. Thanks, Chair. Um, well, I guess relating to, to this issue around rural residential and things, um, as I understand it, there's the issue of, I guess, having large lot residential, for example, on the edge of the city where you might have wanted to expand in 20 years or something. So that's obviously make is a poor outcome but we also does this take into account um in any way the impact of say future development form and how that might then impact on say our transport system in our metro areas or you know towns and cities so for example you might be far enough away that it's not somewhere where you you're realistically going to expand, but because they're not living in Cambridge, where they might be close to um, 
a bus that could take them to work in Hamilton, for example, mm. then they're almost certainly going to have to drive. And so it's, yeah, just wondering, does that take into account uh, impact on networks? Alongside um, it, it and other bits of the strategy do, and that's yeah. why we've got that directive that says we don't really want that kind of development occurring on the, whatever you want to call the boundary of Hamilton is. Um, yeah. So so I, I'm a, I, I think it's a really important principle, this directive mm -hmm. that we do need to stand on. It's something that's been a, a, a sore point in an attention point in future proof ever since it began, be mm -hmm. fair to say. Um, I feel like I need to buy some time to find some wordsmithing and to work with technical people to find a way of of um, of refining it if we can to provide more certainty because I don't think the intent was really to lock down on rural residential everywhere. And I think that's what we were intending with the wording villages up there was that we acknowledged that villages were things that had a slightly more dispersed pattern, but we didn't want rural residential, certainly around our main urban centers where we would prefer to grow to urban, urbanize them. Um, so I'd, I'd like some time. <laughs> when, when you talk about buying time, Robert. <laughs> yeah. That's the problem. I haven't got any, have I? <laughs> <laughs> Did you envisage that during the course of today's meeting or going away? And I'd like to to haul my officials together for at least fifteen minutes just to have a chat. Okay. Yeah, I'm because I, I want to get a resolution to get this thing adopted. I don't. Yes, so do I. Yes. Yep. David, I'll come back to it. <laughs> I'm not going to comment on the issue because I'm not sure it's appropriate for us to, but. From a process point of view, is this not something you could just run through and have a submission from Waikato District that you can then tidy it up later? That's a good way of doing it, actually, David. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, I, I was going to suggest the same thing. I think there are a number of tweaks and things that each individual partner will probably want to um, reflect on after some of the conversations we've had today. And through the deliberation process, um, in the consultation process, perhaps we wrap everything up once we hear from our communities as well. Just as a suggestion. Yeah, I, I, I suppose what I was hearing though, in terms of the significance of this directive of actually going out with whatever potential amended wording there is. Um, I'm only here chairing the meeting, so I'll take guidance in terms yeah. of that. I think I think the suggestion of a submission is a good one for us to to buy the time because hopefully I can get to a place where the officials can agree what the submissions are and we can turn it into a future proof submission. So. I guess I I would like to think that there was a, more of a discussion at this end of it rather than as, as a submitter into the future proof. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we would all want to consider further, but I think some discussion around those words and what it means before this goes out is more is more important than being a submitter to my own to our own plan that we're partnering up with. But that's my personal opinion without discussion. So so a but, way forward is that once we complete any further discussion on the F, on any other matters in the FDS, what I propose to do is we'll adjourn the meeting, say 15 minutes, mm. we'll let the officials come together. They can have a discussion and then come back and we'll see what that that then looks like. And then we can decide, um, is that sufficient or is it best left then to, and it may be a, a future proof submission as opposed to leaving it to individual partners. So if people were happy with that. Angela. Yeah, just, just before we do break. Just had a question on, I suppose, hierarchy of um, documents. Um, to my understanding, and if staff could help me understand a little bit more, um, the future proof strategy gives effect to the RPS, and we've just done a tweak on the NPSUD. So this one is quite closely linked to that one. So 
how do um, submissions then then work? Um, okay, so in terms of the hierarchy, um, you obviously have the national policy statements and then the RPS and then um, the future development strategy is something that is created under the NPSUD, but it is consulted on under the Local Government Act. So it is a subservient document. Um, however, it, you are required under the NPSUD, NPSUD to have regard to a future development strategy when you're making your planning decisions. So it does have additional weight through that, but obviously the RPS has that higher weight. Um, in the amendment that we just did to the RPS to recognise uh, the amendment to future, the, the updated future proof strategy in the NPSUD, we did word it in a way that it does um, refer to and give give weight to the future development strategy where there are changes to the settlement pattern and the staging, acknowledging that that is going to be an iterative process and that the RPS is more static. So um, it does sort of convey a little bit of extra status on, on that part of the FDS. Um, but obviously the RPS is still that higher order document that you have to give effect to in your district plans. Okay. Leah. I've just got a question if, if we as officials are going to be asked to sort of go away. I'm just the question around the, you know, looking at 9.6. I'm just a little bit troubled as to the conversation that I, I guess through the FDS we have a settlement pattern identified. It's it's well and truly worked through the uh, lots of maps. Um, and I'm just not sure what further wording is going to help there. I mean, I, I guess what is sought by modifying that? I mean, what, what troubles me here is that we're trying to develop compact communities and invest with that. If we loosen that wording, particularly around the centre Hamilton, it has dramatic impacts on the city and, and as Mayor Paula said, substantial costs. So I, I guess I'm, it goes to the kind of very heart of what Future Proof is about. So, so if we're asked to go away and look at that, what for what purpose? Is that to allow more residential to occur? And if so, where? And is that identified in the settlement pattern? So I guess I'm troubled by the, the question. It feels very open-ended and I'm therefore uncomfortable because of the investment decisions and implications it has for us all, particularly in this case Hamilton. So, so I guess I'm just seeking greater clarity as to why the question is posed as to what is the outcome that might be then as a result of that if we loosen the wording. Because um, cer certainly we don't want to see um, uh, more cost as a result of that thrown into the the city environment, which is already struggling to deliver our infrastructure needs and, and cost of an urban environment, and we are under pressure to try and urbanise our city more, and struggling with that. So, so I guess that's just sort of a, a question, I guess, me, Jackie, possibly to yourself in terms of raising the, the point to understand what is the outcome you're seeking by modifying that wording. Oh, Jackie, can you? 9.2, can I pull it down, please, a little bit? Look, it actually wasn't my question. So <laughs> I say this with like, no, no, it is our question. I, 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 own, I own that space. Yeah. Um, it's really just making sure that because we, when we're saying we're limiting, because when you look at this agenda, updating the reflect the MPS HPR, adding new text to Directive 2 and 3 about limiting rural residential development, that's a big statement for our rural and provincial district within future proof and clarifying what that means in terms of the intent and the unpacking of that whether it, and then of course if is that just around Hamilton and into what extent and what the implications both for us and anyone else is around those you know business cases infrastructure pressures we all have those we I mean all the pressures of Hamilton absolutely understand we all have the same pressures so just really understanding what those mean because if you take it from the agenda, it's quite a broad statement. We take them back to this, not a planner, just we're wanting to clarify what that means and what we're signing off in terms of going to consultation. Murphy. Sorry, can I just clarify, because I was the one that made those changes. It was more about splitting out the fact that you have now an MPS for highly productive land that has very strong wording. It says avoid. Um, and our um, if future proof strategy didn't say avoid. So it was it was about splitting those out into multiple um, 
separate directives to make it clear that where it is highly productive land, it is that avoid. Where it's not highly productive land, then um, 9.3 comes in, and that's the one that says that um, where it's not highly productive land, um, it is limited around our existing towns and villages so that you do have that more compact urban footprint. And that goes to um, the, the question about um, people being isolated and car dependent. We don't want to encourage that. Um, it also, so basically all those directives should kind of be read together and also in the context that we do have a growth target for Waikato and Waipa and Maramara Piako, that 90% of growth will be in our urban um, enablement and urban and village enablement areas. So we are saying most of the growth will be in those areas that we've already identified. Um, there will be a bit of growth in the rural areas, but we're not expecting to see large areas of rural um, residential popping up across the, the, the rural area or scattered across the rural area. So sort of in context, it all kind of paints the picture of, of where we would see rural residential. Okay, just before I go to me, Adrian, Leah, in terms of you, 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 you've had a response <laughs> in terms from Mayor Adrian, anything to Mine might simplify add it. further? My comment might simplify it. Okay, Mayor Adrian. If you just go straight to the document in the terms and, de and description, rural residential is defined as residential development in rural areas, which is predominantly for residential activity and is not ancillary to a rural or agricultural use. It includes countryside living. Is that not the definition that that applies to? When you look at what rural residential is, is that doesn't that just sort that? Because we all know we've got to avoid it. Matter matters, prime. Mm. We can't, and we're not planning on any more rural residential. So, surely the definition just sorts that out without tinkering unnecessarily. Thanks, so. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, I, I was sure. wondering if there, yeah, to um, Mayor Adrian's point, maybe there was not, it's not totally obvious what rural residential means when <clears throat> someone's looking at it here. Yeah. Um, From a planning that it, perspective. I, I presume like a lifestyle block, large lot residential kind of in rural area. Sure that no, that's what rural it's. residential is a small two and a half thousand square metre yeah. section yeah. self-contained. Mm. Lifestyle is several hectares. So there's definite definitions around what we're talking about. So I think, yeah, let's not overthink it. So just before I go to Mayor Paula, so just having a quick chat with Robert, whether there's some something more explicit that actually ensures the, that reference back or connection to that definition. Mayor Paula. I'm not unhappy with that the way that it was. I don't think there should be any, use the word deepening of it. I think the definition is helpful. The comments that you made were helpful. But I think at the end of the day, I wouldn't want to see any of these directives watered down. In fact, if anything, I was looking to provide an in additional cross-reference. I think the definition is one part of that cross-reference, Adrian. And I think the other stuff, well, what you said, is another part of the cross-reference. But there's still, if I were going to take it a step further, I still feel we need to recognise um, <clears throat> the spatial, the plan, the planning, spatial planning patterns that we've agreed on for reasons because of the outcomes. This is doesn't talk about some of the potential, uh, the avoidance of some of the unwanted outcomes because we've had those in the past and I guess we're trying to move past those right the, the more ad hoc approach to growth or case by case basis into a spatial plan for the sub region that makes everyone else every one of us thrive independently but as a unit I thought we anyway, so that's just just my view so I'm kind of on staying in the same ground um if not adding some additional cross references to Helpful. Okay. <laughs> Just look at the staff. If staff have read my brain well. I guess though the, the Mayor Jackie's um, I can redefine Mayor Jackie. Um, the concern is what is the vicinity of Hamilton? Vicinity, vicinity could be Narawai here, Huntley could go further up because there is fear of influence that extends, you know, further out. But if we just simply remove the word vicinity and say in the 
uh, around the boundary of Hamilton, um, that should may narrow that or clarify what we mean by vicinity. I'm I'm just wondering, given the reference that Mayor Adrian said and the need for some cross-referencing back to definitions, whether we we could spend a lot of time on this particular matter, whether we leave it as is, do the cross-referencing, et cetera, in terms of being more explicit, um, in terms of then getting it out for um, consultation. Sorry, he doesn't have any news to share. <laughs> <laughs> we don't care about that. Sorry, apologies. Mathie. Um, so I just want to point out on page um, 83, which is the text that um, introduces the um, the context of the rural area, it does mention yeah, that the, what rural residential development um, is in considered to be so that is there in that um in the background section and but we can add more um and it, and it talks about the pressure on um highly productive land and and that we are trying to tightening things up but we can uh, maybe add some more text in there just to provide the background um rather than tweaking with the, the growth management directive yeah. so just adding in some of the background that the, sort of the planning that has been done and, and what the intent you know for, make it clear what the intentions are. Yeah, and that was, you know, it's a, a clarifying what it is. And so then I, hopefully when we have our submissions come back, you know, we'll, they'll be a lot more succinct and helpful to the outcomes that we all want. We were, At the end of the day, we all want good town planning. Okay. Yeah. Just one final point on that. That page has now disappeared. <coughs> oh, I, I, uh, thank you. I, well, I think, I think that's useful. Uh, and it talks about the really important values of the rural areas. Um, of course, it still remains silent in terms of the interconnectedness with the metro areas because uh, people need access to the services the metro areas also supply. So um, just making sure that that isn't forgotten about. And they're again speaking to that thing of impact. You put something here, you put a group of people living here, okay, that's that may be what's agreed and agreeable, but it may have an impact on your neighbour. Might be Hamilton, might be someone else. So I think we've got to be fairly explicit about that. And most of the um, rural areas do have local service towns, but they also rely on some services from the metro. Okay, there's nothing further. What I was going to propose to do, I'd I'd like to um, just spend five minutes <laughs> with Dave and Robert, given the the thinking and the ideas and the suggestions that have been put on the table, because we have some recommendations, just need to tweak some of those, given what's been presented. So I was going to, if there is nothing further on any other matters, what I don't want to do is reconvene and we have another discussion in terms of a whole raft of other matters. So this is your last opportunity if there's anything else. No, there are not. Paula, is are you another matter or are you? No. <laughs> okay. Could we have, Chair, sorry, could we have the recommendations emailed that we saw on the screen earlier? Oh, the additional yeah, addition. changes one. They will come back. That's so why we're about to be amended. Yes, <laughs> yes. So, and they will flick up on the screen. That's why I need 10 minutes. So what I'm proposing to do then, if there's nothing else, we'll adjourn to 3.30. We will then come back to the recommendations and um, hopefully we can resolve on those and then that will complete the um, public part of the meeting. So we stand adjourned to 3.30. Yeah. We...